So uh, welcome to the first video in regards to applications of isotopes from the 12th lecture of the sixth week. And what I'm going to focus on here is a little bit about what the Messelson stall experiment is, determination of small concentration in an indirect, indirect manner. And I realize that this may not be very easy to understand from the, uh, from the lecture slides alone, and just the basics of carbon-14 dating. So let's get started. As I've written here, the Messenger stall experiment proves the semi-conservative DNA replication. Mind my handwriting, not a lot I can do about that. This is semi-conservative. And what do I mean by that? The experiment went as such. We had a little pastry dish that contained a solution that has nitrogen 15. It's the only type of nitrogen that was there. And we placed uh, E. coli bacteria to colonize in there. And we know that these bacteria have DNA that contains nitrogen. And that means that all of the nitrogen that is going to be in their DNA is only going to be from nitrogen 15, because that's the, the, uh, that's the only form of nitrogen that is found in their environment. And what did we do after? The next thing that we did is we prepared another dish here that contained a solution that has nitrogen, but only nitrogen 14 nitrogen 14 only. And what we did now is that we took these little guys here, our E. coli bacteria, and we transferred them to, these, to this container here. And we let them populate and, um, and uh, basically reproduce. And we know that in order to reproduce, they would need new DNA. They would need to replicate their DNA. And they're only going to be able to use nitrogen 14 to do that because it's the only type of nitrogen there at the moment. So let's just say I'm taking one of these guys that had two strands of DNA that are comprised from blue nitrogen 15. Now what we observed is that the way that the replication took place is that these two strands separated, separated, and the new strand was built or was composed alongside it. And this is semi-conservative replication. And if this is the first generation of these new E. coli bacteria, you can imagine that this is just going to keep on going, just like so. And with each new generation, I'm going to see less and less nitrogen 15. And this makes sense because my strands separate, and on top of them, new strands are built containing only the existing form of nitrogen. So this is the first generation. This is already the second generation. And the mesosyl stall experiment actually observed this. It observed the semi-conservative DNA replication. So far, so good. And this is basically just, uh, just a, an example of using stable isotopes for research. And there has been a question, I believe, uh, the type of isotopes that are used for research are only radioactive isotopes. Incorrect. We can use stable isotopes as well. Let's keep on trucking. And now we're talking about determination of small concentrations. And, uh, and we're going to try and keep it as simple as possible. What I have here is some sort of sample. And in the sample, I'm wondering, do I have these Orange, uh, orange molecules. Let's say I have this orange proteins and I'm wondering, do they exist in my solution? So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare antibodies. And antibodies are Y-shaped molecules that are targeted, that are targeted to these molecules here. That means that these molecules are going to stick to my antibodies. And this is the antigen binding site. So this is the antibody. This is my antibody. And this is the antigen to my antibody, which means this is basically the targeted molecule by the antigen. And it's going to dock here. This is the docking site. And what do I do with these little antibodies? Well, it's pretty simple. I have a dish here, obviously, as I always do. I have a dish here. And I put these antibodies, let's say I'm designing them in green. I'm putting these antibodies and I'm attaching them. I'm just sticking them to the bottom of this container. And they're really going to stick in there because I'm using some sort of method that is not really relevant for this explanation, but they're going to stick here. And now, as you can imagine, I'm going to pour my sample right in here. And that means that if I have these little buggers in my sample, then they are effectively going to attach, they're going to stick to my antibodies here. 
providing they exist. They're going to stick to my antibodies. And I can have up to two sticking at these binding sites, these binding sites of these Y-shaped antibody molecules. Very nice. And this is a good way to determine small concentrations because I can only have, I can, I can have a million of these antibodies, just an arbitrary number, and I can detect very, very small concentrations of these antigens. So now what I do is, instead of, uh, what, what I have left is just the rest of the solution around, so I'm just going to pour it out, and these antigens, if they exist, if my molecule of interest exists, it's going to be staying stuck to my antibody. And now I'm going to have, and I already prepared, another container that contains a new type of antibodies that are also designed to stick to this protein of interest. But these antibodies, the cool thing about them is that they have radioactive tracers on them. They have radioactive tracers on them that I can actually follow up on and see because they emit radiation that I can actually look at and see and measure. So now I have all of these guys in here and I know that these guys, these little antibodies are going to stick to this molecule of interest. So I'm going to pour them inside and if they exist, let's just say they are uh, green, no, no, we already use green, let's say they're yellow. So if this molecule of interest exists, I'm going to have all of these radioactive antibodies stuck to it. I'm going to have all of these radioactive antibodies stuck to it and they're going to have their uh, radioactive tracer on them. And what I do is I'm going to try and detect this radiation. And if I put this, then I place this in some sort of a, a detection method, and I detect radiation emitting from this dish, I can actually solve for what is the concentration of these little guys that are inside my sample. And this is a direct this is a direct method of determination of small concentrations. And I'm just going to breeze through, breeze through the indirect method. I'm just having, I have the same, the same, a same dish here, something very similar, only I have another one right next to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place these antibodies that stick to my molecule of interest here, and I'm just going to place it in, in, in the bottom right here. I'm just going to fill it up, and I'm going to do this here in the other dish. And this is going to be my control dish, and you'll see why soon. So what I'm doing now is I can design another substance that is just like this one. It also sticks to these Y-shaped molecules. I can switch it around. So instead of making it, instead of making it orange, I'm going to make it pink. So I have a pink substance that I designed, or that I uh, made up and comprised, that has the same affinity of this guy to this antibody here. And in a second, you'll see why it's important to me. All I'm really looking for, again, is for this guy here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my jar. I have a jar full of these guys. And I'm going to pour this jar in here. And what I can expect is, because this guy and this guy are practically similar, this guy is also going to be attached to my antibodies here and almost fill it up. You can almost expect it to fill it up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, this little jar here, this jar of my sample, I'm just going to pour it in, just like I did before. And if this little guy exists, I can expect it to attach here. Let's just say we have a very small concentration. We have, we have I don't know, one, uh, 0 0.1 millimolar, which is a relatively small concentration. And now this is the amount that was stuck in. And the next thing that I have to do is take, again, take this jar here and pour it in here. And now that means that, that whatever place is left on the little Y-shaped molecules is going to be occupied by this molecule, which again resembles the affinity of this molecule to the antibody. Basically what it means is that it's going to occupy the rest of the spaces here. It's just going to occupy what's left. Perfect. And now what I can do is I can take this dish, the control dish, and being that this little guy, and this is the kick, this little guy is radioactively labeled. It's radioactively labeled. So I can take this control dish, and because this control dish is going to emit radiation, I can measure the amount of radiation it emits, and then I can measure the amount of radiation this dish emits, and I can compare them. I can compare them. And I'm going to have less emission of radiation here because some 
of my target molecule occupying some of the place on the antibody on the antibody's uh, uh, binding site, and then I can compare this all for what is my concentration. Now I realize that this is not very simple to maybe draw in an exam, and I don't imagine they will let you draw this in an exam or ask you to. What you need to know is that you can determine small concentration in a direct and indirect manner using uh, radioactive isotopes, using radioactive isotopes to either label antibodies or to label different molecules. This is all you really need to know, and if you if you don't understand the entirety of this process, or it seems very tedious, or very, very weird to you, very hard to understand, don't, don't stress over it. We're going to keep going and just touch on basics of carbon-14 dating. And really, Khan Academy has awesome videos about, uh, has an awesome video and very interesting about carbon-14 dating, and I think it has quite a few, so it has, uh, has some good uh, points there. But really what I want to tell you is that carbon-14 is constantly, constantly forming, constantly forming in our, in our atmosphere, you can say, or in a specific part in our atmosphere due to cosmic, cosmic interactions, interactions with nitrogen, interactions with nitrogen. And effectively, these cosmic rays, they come in and they interact with nitrogen and they turn it into carbon-14. And carbon-14 is constantly forming. And being that carbon-14 is constantly forming, it gets to our, it sips down to our water sources. So our water sources are going to be filled with carbon-14. And being that there's going to be a bunch of this, this green depicted carbon-14 in our water, it's also going to be in our in our trees, and this is a tree. They're going to be in our trees, and they're going to be in the ground, and animals are going to graze, and it's going to get to the biological system of animals, and this is a cow, in case you're wondering. Yes, it has four legs, one leg right next to the other. I have no idea what cows look like that, but let's just say it's, it's a brand new animal that I just made up that has a lot of carbon-14 in it now. And maybe I come along and I take a bite of this animal, and I have carbon-14 in me now. What's important to understand with carbon-14 dating is, is that live biological, system, bi live biological systems, only when they're alive, they uptake carbon-14 regularly. Because when I'm dead, I don't really feed. I don't really interact with my environment. I just decay. So as long as I'm alive, I'm going to have a steady supply of carbon-14. And when I die, when a biological sample dies, let's just say there's this bone here that is long dead, is not really uptaking carbon-14 yet, I can look at how much carbon-14 is in it now, what's the concentration of carbon-14 in it now, based on the fact that I know that it used to live, and I can solve for it by using the half-life of carbon-14, which is 5,730 years roughly. I can solve for how old is this bone. This is basically carbon-14 dating, and it's, it is an example of using uh, radioactive isotopes for research. Perfect. Hopefully you found this helpful and I'll see you in the next video.